December this morning, it's cold outside and many people are with their families and staying at home this morning. Just like to welcome everybody out there on the internet that'll be watching this. Um, we just, we're glad to be able to gather together this morning and, and worship the Lord together and hear from his word together. You know, um, it's been a good Christmas. I mean, the world out there, um, there's a lot of darkness. There's a lot of trouble. But, um, you know, as I was gathered with my family yesterday, I, I just had to be thankful for all the blessings that I saw sitting across the table from me. And maybe you feel um, alone right now through the season. I know Christmas is a hard time for many people, but I want you to know there is a God that sees you exactly where you are, and he loves you. And he came to give life to you, to us, to everyone who places their trust in him. This morning, I, I'm not sure if there's a children's church going on, is there? Yes, there is? Okay. Well, kids, I'm going to dismiss you to children's church, and I was just wondering if I could get uh, maybe uh, Kim and Danny to uh, come and take offering and tithes today. Bless you, kids. You guys can go through here. That's fine. Have a great Sunday school. <laughs> Danny, would you uh, just uh, ask blessing on today's tithes and offerings? Amen. It's hard to believe that uh, Christmas 2021 is over. It's hard to believe it's Boxing Day. <laughs> but I am glad to be able to come uh, here today. I, I always uh, say t Sunday morning is my favorite day of the week. I, I love Sunday mornings because we can gather together as believers. We can focus our attention on the author and perfecter of our faith. And, um, you know, in a world that lives for self, we live for Christ, and we live for one another, and, and I love you guys. Um, welcome to our visitors today. Um, we're glad to have you with us. Now, prior to our Christmas celebrations this year, we were exploring the life and ministry of Jesus as recorded in the book of Mark, and today... We're going to continue in the series that I've uh, started in Mark, and we're going to be heading into chapter 4. We're now at a place in the earthly ministry of Jesus where all of the miracles that he'd been performing as a sign um, grew his popularity so that literally thousands of people were coming from all over the land at that time to come and see Jesus. There was just epic proportions of people coming, and they were all curious as to what was happening and um, what Jesus was doing. And this is the point in the ministry of the Lord Jesus where he began to teach the people. And one of the things you look at when you look in the Gospels is that uh, Jesus used parables as a teaching tool. And uh, parables were, uh, were a common form of teaching in Judaism. It wasn't foreign to the people. Um, the Eastern way of teaching is often very uh, picturistic, and word pictures are painted. So the Lord frequently used parables as a mean, means of illustrating profound divine truths. And these stories are remembered more easily. And... Uh, the characters are bold, and the symbolism is rich. And uh, that being said, 
many of the parables that Jesus told were very difficult for some of the people to understand. And um, I believe that Jesus actually spoke in this way in order to separate his true disciples from those who would come maybe only for entertainment purposes or maybe some of the people that were gathering were looking for a way to discredit Jesus and, and, uh, and call him down. And we do know that by this time in Jesus' ministry, scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees were looking for a way to kill Jesus because he hadn't come as the Messiah that they wanted or that fit their paradigm the way they thought. But uh, the reality was that their hearts were hardened to the truth. So let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 4, and we'll start with the first nine verses, and we'll have the scriptures on the overhead for you if you want. Um, Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things in parables and, his, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell amongst thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, we'll start into verse 10 here, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Well, in this parable, which was the first real significant parable, there was one smaller parable before this, but this was the first significant parable that Jesus publicly proclaimed. And many people in the crowds, they didn't understand the meaning. It was as if Jesus was hiding truth from some of them on purpose. What was Jesus saying, and why did he have to speak in parables? Now, I believe there are several reasons why Jesus taught in parables. And the first reason is that when teaching in parables, Jesus could accurately deal with deep spiritual issues exhaustively in story form. Now, you can use an example from real life, but... Jesus actually pulled a story together to hit every single point that he wanted to hit on. So these parables were packed with meaning. And this is an effective method of conveying God's truth to every person, regardless of their age or stage of life. So that was one reason why Jesus spoke in parables. Secondly, he spoke to the crowds in parables to divide the self-righteous, disinterested, or unrepentant listeners from the true, honest seekers. I believe that. Because God is a just God. He gave everyone to the opportunity to hear the same truth. And over and over again, we see this pattern in Scripture. He never brought judgment without full warning. Having sent his, his prophets, you see the prophets in the past 
in the scriptures. He never brought judgment without full warning, having sent his prophets repeatedly um, to call nations or his own people to repentance and to humble themselves. And he said it again and again, and he would give them warning upon warning. The state of their hearts was revealed by whether they thought deeply on it, then understood and received it, or instead chose to block up their ears and harden their hearts. And this is why Jesus said at the end of the parable, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. You see, um, there are some truths that, that some people aren't ready to hear right away. This being the case, there, there comes a time where a person's experiences might teach them to understand what they didn't see at first or what they weren't willing to see at first. In Matthew's gospel, we see that Jesus calls people to seek him. See, there were people that were coming to see Jesus just to look at the trick show, right? But God wants people to seek him, not specifically just to have miracles performed for them. He wanted, to seek, he wanted people to seek him because he was worthy of being sought, and he desired relationship with the people that he was, he was seeking to engage with. This is why I'm going to read a verse, two verses in Matthew, because it ties in with this. In Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus talked in parables because he was seeking the seekers. He wanted those who would listen to the parables to open themselves to the deeper meanings, the truth which would eventually be revealed to them. But for those who had wicked, unbelieving hearts, who God knows will never be open to receiving his truth, those people will ever be seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. It's not that God does not want people to be saved here. That's not the issue. The issue is that those whose hearts are hardened towards him, who are wicked, unbelieving in their hearts. They do not want to really submit to God. They just want God for what they can get out of him. They want to live in darkness rather than in light. So the Lord spoke to them in parables, knowing that they would not seek the deeper meanings. John three seventeen to 20 speaks clearly into the heart of God on this very issue. When it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. The light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. So you see that Jesus was seeking the seekers. He was separating the sheep from the goats, per se. The seekers would seek and would ask God to help them understand what he was saying. Those who weren't seekers would just brush it off. Thirdly, I believe Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables to fulfill ancient prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. In Psalm 78, we see a prophecy which was written saying, um, My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter things hidden things, 
things from old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. So true to form, right? He prophesied, the, the Lord prophesied through his prophets that the Messiah would come to them and would talk to them in parables. And true to form, what, what he was trying to accomplish, the disciples of Jesus that were gathered closely to Jesus, including the 12, they were perplexed at the meaning of the parable of the sower. They, they went to Jesus and they asked him to explain the deeper meaning so they could understand. You see, they were seekers. And, and sometimes, you know, like when we are out there, sometimes things happen in, in our, our lives or sometimes God speaks through his word and, and we're perplexed. And we have to mind the scriptures and we have to pray and we have to, we have to ask others that have, have walked with the Lord maybe longer than us, well, what is this? How, how can I understand this? And you see, God reveals his word. When we seek him, we will find him. When we knock, the door will be opened. There is, this is the Lord in the way that he works. Mark 4, 13 to 20, then just Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? As human beings, sometimes we can be pretty thick. <laughs> I know I can be. Sometimes the lessons uh, come, don't come easily. But you see, God wants us not to trust in our own intellect and our own pride. He wants us to come to him and humble ourselves before him. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit gives us insight into his word to learn the things that he wants us to learn. This is why the scripture says that the word without the spirit is dead. You know, you can read the Bible as an unbeliever and not get it until the Holy Spirit brings it to life in you. Have you ever found that where all of a sudden you're reading on a page in the Bible and it's just almost like it jumps off the page at you and you go, oh, I never saw that before. I, I get this all the time. Maybe I'm just kind of dense. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I do. this happens all the time when I'm... <laughs> When I'm studying the Word of God, it's like God will reveal something through an example in life, through another person who, who, who says something, and oh, and just you just connect the dots, right? God's good that way, and He does that. So, the farmer sows the Word, Jesus said. Some people are like seed along the path where the Word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the Word that was sown in them. Others like Seeds sown on rocky places hear the word at, and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away. Still others, like the seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other thing, for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed grown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Wow. In this parable, Jesus introduces a farmer. He doesn't say directly who the farmer is. The farmer could refer to Jesus himself or to people who, who the Lord sends to preach his word of truth as God's representatives, or both. So whether it's Jesus himself or his disciples who scatter God's words of truth onto the ground of people's hearts, that's who the farmer is in this parable. The various types of soil represent human hearts and their state of receptivity to the truth of the word of God. In verse 15, Jesus said that some of God's word lands into hearts that are hardened and unbroken for God. The word does not penetrate into them and it sits on the surface level. This is the person who shrugs when God's word is spoken or shared with them. They're unyielding to the Holy Spirit, unmoved, untroubled by the message of God's truth. They're un unstirred by it. Internally, this person says, no, I will not accept this message. They, they in turn push away, and it doesn't penetrate their spirit. 
And because it lays on the surface, the devil and his servants of darkness easily come and pluck the truth off of the hearts of these people and in place seed that person with lies. That person soon forgets the message given to them and they go on their way, indifferent, continuing to live their lives in the way that seems fitting to them, refusing to acknowledge God's truth. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is the way of death. Um, now, we traditionally look at this and we say this is the unbeliever's heart who doesn't take any of God's truth in. And, uh, and they shed the truth and the devil steals it out of their heart. But I, I want to say that each of these kinds of hearts can also be within believers. There's another, there's another layer to this, you see. This kind of heart that we're talking about here can, can be a believer's heart as well. It can be my heart. When my heart is not um, yielded to the Lord, there's times in life, right? The Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature or the lust of the flesh, right? There's times where my heart experiences a hardening, right? Your heart too. Believers' hearts can be hardened to the truth of God's word as well. And many believers over the centuries have refused to listen to sound teaching. And they've been sidetracked into error due to the hardness of their heart when the word of truth is sown into them or onto them. Some will listen to God's truth being read or preached to them. But because of the state of the hardness of the heart, they will refuse to let God's truth penetrate. Because they really, there's a rebel inside of each one of us. The heart is desperately wicked and prone to wander from the living God. Yes, as a believer, you have a new nature. You're born again in the spirit. But you also have this wrestling match with the old man, this sin nature. And, you know, whichever, they're like the two dogs, right, that you feed. And the one that you feed the most grows the biggest and the most dominant. So if we allow the sin nature to take root, the Bible tells us very clearly we have to, have to watch out for sin's deceitfulness. Be on guard against it. It's deceitful. The devil is a liar and the father of all lies, and he, he likes to twist things to twist the truth and to rob the truth from us and to plant lies instead. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean that I'm not susceptible to lies. We've got to be on guard. Watch your life and doctrine closely, says the word of the Lord. You see, because sometimes we like to live the way that we want to live. Deep down inside, I want to hold on to the stuff when I really know that I ought to be letting go. But I want to do things that suit my own agenda. That's the sin nature. The apostle Paul instructed Pastor Timothy to be prepared for this hard-hearted response to the message of God's truth, even from amongst God's people. Paul encouraged Pastor Timothy and all pastors and teachers of Christ's future church not to get discouraged when this happens, but to be faithful in speaking the truth, even when some will re reject the message of it. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-5, to Paul writes this to Timothy. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and of his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth 
and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So, Paul was given the instruction, giving the instructions to Timothy, and that's to all teachers in the church. There's gifts of teaching, and there's gifts of pastoring and all that. I'm given the charge to be faithful in discharging the duties of my ministry, and that is to share the truth of God's word in the proper context for which it was designed to encourage, sometimes to rebuke. Sometimes there's just different things that I, I'm supposed to do. Understanding that it's not always going to be accepted. There's going to be times when you speak the truth to your family. And they're going to say, Heh, I don't want to listen to that because I'd rather do this. Don't be discouraged. It's not just pastors and teachers. This can be applied to everybody. There's people in your sphere of influence in your walk with you. God's calling you to be faithful, a faithful ambassador for him, speaking the truth in love. And sometimes that means all of these things. The hardened heart, you have to be prepared for it, though, because the hardened heart will not accept the seed of truth from God's word. It's going gonna, it's gonna to not penetrate. And you're going to watch the devil come along and steal it out of the heart. And it's heart-wrenching to watch that. It hurts. It's not a very pleasant thing. But there's hope. There is hope. The hardened heart does not have to stay hard. God is able to plow up the hardened ground of a person's heart and make it soft. And in, in place of a heart of stone, Give a person a heart of flesh. So don't be discouraged. Continue to discharge the duties of your particular ministry that God's given you in the way that he's called you to. And stand firm. And don't be discouraged, but be faithful. The hardened heart wasn't the only kind of soil on which the truth of God's word landed. Some of the word which was preached to men fell into hearts which were covered with a thin layer of good soil on the surface. But underneath everything, there was hardened and stony ground. Now these people, in their hearts, hear the truth of God's word, and they gladly receive it with openness. And it penetrates the surface, and their spirit immediately um, takes that truth in, and the truth starts to grow like a, a wonderful plant inside of their spirit. And it begins to spring to life. Perhaps this person is open to hearing God's, uh, God's word uh, initially out of curiosity. Perhaps through listening to a fervent gospel presentation or a message or a song or, or maybe an emotionally stirring event in their life. Maybe a loved one dies and they, re they recognize grandma was a saint of Christ and, and they're stirred in the midst of the emotion of it all, and they, and they decide that they're going to open and they receive the message with joy. This person makes a confession in Jesus, but of, to Jesus, of Jesus, but in reality, reality, it's only a superficial acknowledgement. Although the initial state would indicate they had come to Christ, it's possible that they only came to the Lord to help them through some temporary thing that was coming upon them, or they thought that the gospel could be the icing on their cake. Maybe they heard some of the benefits of serving Christ and said, I want the benefits, because there are a lot of benefits to being a disciple of Christ. Really, there is. And we can't be shy about, about telling people that, but we also can't be shy about telling people the cost of being a disciple of Christ. Because there is benefits. Yes, there is. And they resonate into all of eternity. But there is a cost for serving the Lord. There is a cost to be paid in, in following Jesus. And we see examples of that. Like the rich young ruler. Remember them? Remember him? 
He didn't want to give Christ his complete heart because on the surface level, he was all ooey-gooey and, Jesus, I like what you have to say and I really en enjoy seeing what you're doing and I want to be part of this. And Jesus wanted him to give his whole heart. Yeah, he knew what was hanging that man up. First, give all that you have to the poor and then come and follow me. He couldn't do it, could he? Why? Because underneath it all, there was a hardness where he was unyielded. I'll give you this, Jesus, but I won't give you this. I can't give you this. And God knows the hard parts of everybody's hearts, right? So deep inside, that person's heart was hard, unbroken soil. And even though this individual accepted the word of the Lord with gladness at first, it would have been better if they had received it with deep repentance and a willingness to give everything. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. Some professing Christians have no root in themselves. Their root is in their parents or in their Christian friends or in their pastor. Then there are many more whose religion must be sustained by enthusiastic surroundings. They seem to have been baptized in boiling water and unless the temperature around them is kept up to that point, they wither away. Their religion is born of mere excitement that will die when the excitement is over. There's a lot of truth to that. Because the fertility of this person's heart is shallow, even though there is some fertility to it, they don't develop a proper root system. A strong, healthy root system is necessary for the health of any plant. And the root system draws the nutrients and the moisture from the ground into the plant. The water is drawn through the root system. And the health of the plant depends upon its root system, particularly when things get tough. If a plant doesn't have a root system established, when things get tough, when it gets hot, when it gets parched and dry, when the storms come and blow and when everything starts to fall apart on the outside, the root system will determine how that plant will fare. In Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Sadly, however, the person with shallow, superficial commitment to the Lord is going to wither when times get tough, when the heat gets turned on, when people with hearts like this encounter hardship or persecution the true state of their Christian belief is exposed to be fraudulent. And the truth of God's word that it started to grow within them withers and dies. It, it shrivels up. And that person's very unhealthy. And that person may not even have been a true believer in the first place. But if they were a true believer and they had come to a saving knowledge of Christ, they remain in this perpetual state of Christian infancy and don't grow into the healthy, mature believer that God intended them because God intends for us to grow healthy and strong so that we bear fruit. They're content to live in the shallows of faith. But when it comes time for trouble, they quickly backslide and find themselves struggling for life. The writer of the book of Hebrews in five, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14 says this. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk still being an infant is not acquainted with the teaching of about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. God doesn't want us just to bask in the shallows. He wants us to go deep. He wants us to grow strong and be mighty warriors in his kingdom for his glory and for his purposes. He wants all of us to leave infancy and to grow up 
I've seen Christians that have been Christians for 40 years, and they still don't even know the gospel, the basics of the gospel. They still struggle with it. They know, but they don't know. It's just like they've stalled, and they, they're still in the same place as they were when they first accepted the Lord 40 years prior. That's not God's desire for us. God wants to break up the fallow ground where there's rock inside of us. There's hardness. He wants us to let him take his, his dynamite and blow that rock to smithereens and let his supernatural rake take that rock out of us so that our hearts are soft and pliable and good soil. And he's able to do that. We just have to be willing to let go of the things that are hard within us. So Jesus goes on to explain that there's two other kinds of hearts where the person receives the truth of God's word deep within. The one, provi- uh, one grows strong and there's a harvest of righteousness that comes, while the other does not. Of the three types of soil that don't produce a harvest, the seed sown among weeds presents an altogether different scenario. It's different than the seed which is sown on the hard path, which is snatched away right, around, right away before it, it, it sprouts, snatched by the enemy. Or the seed in rocky soil, which, which is shallow and, and withers soon after it's germinated once it comes to trouble and trials, having to face troubles and trials. And in this third kind of soil, the truth of God's word actually takes root and starts to grow deep. And yet, as the plants of truth are growing... Weeds of lies also sprout up and grow alongside the plants that come from the truth of God's word. This person's open, but they're open to not just God. They're open to all kinds of other things alongside of it. They call themselves seekers, but there's no discernment. They're accepting all kinds of stuff into their hearts, and it's it's mixing with the truth of God's word, and the seeds of lies are being planted deep within that person as well. And because uh, the, the, the lies or the seeds, the two different kinds of seeds, because they compete for nutrients, sunlight, and room to grow, the weeds become a threat to the health and maturity of, of God's truth within that person's heart. Jesus tells us these weeds are like a preoccupation, excessive preoccupation with this world's business, worries about different things in life, and a lust to become rich. They they can distract a person from the true um, purpose in life, like God desires for us to, to, to live for him and to live a life that's pleasing to him. Why? Because we desire to glorify him, because we love him, and we want to be relationally close to him for all of eternity. This is the desire of our heart. This is my desire, O oh God, to worship you, to live for you, to, to, to live and breathe. This is the air I breathe, your spirit living in me. This is my daily bread. This is the heart that God desires. God, I, I just want you to be everything in my life. And I want you to shine in me and through me so that I can be pleasing to you. I love you, Father. And that's why the first two commandments, loving God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, that's the core of of righteousness. The the truth is growing in the depths of the weed-filled heart, and they soon find that the weeds will begin to dominate the garden, and, and they'll start to choke out the truth. The word of God grows, but it but so does everything else. And there's a pattern with this that can be seen over time. And as a person with this state of heart gets distracted by everything going on in their lives, in the physical plane, they begin to lose interest in spiritual things. And the truths that were at one time so vibrant within them stop growing and they're choked out by the things of the world. And this can happen to us in seasons. I've had this happen to me. This has been a season of my life. I'm speaking to you from experience here. Maybe you speak from experience as well. You guys brave the cold and you're here this morning and you're seeking the Lord. That's awesome. There's times in my life where I would just was nonchalant. 
I was more concerned about my stocks and what was going on in the, in the world system than I was about the things of the Lord. So again, with this kind of heart, okay, Jesus is telling the story about the truth being planted. These other things, the deception that's out there, the deceitfulness of wealth and all this stuff, there's all kinds of things that are sparkly and draw our attention, but God's like, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Don't turn to the things outside to try and satisfy what I have created you to be satisfied in me. When we turn our attention to the things outside in the world, yeah, we might have this temporary fix, but it's not satisfying. It will never satisfy the deep craving that we have for, for unity with our Savior. So, is it possible for a weed-filled heart to come around? Absolutely it is. By the grace of God, we need to ask the gardener to take the weeds out of our heart. God, if there's been lies that have been planted deep within me, in my spirit, I've, I've bought into some lies deep down inside. Expose them, Lord. Show me what they are and take them away from me, Lord. Father, be the weeder, weeder in my heart. Let your, own, let your truth remain and let all lies be expelled from me. First Corinthians 5, 10 to 14 reads this. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because, on the, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. God's desire is that we live this life wholeheartedly devoted to him. Is it possible for us to live a life that's fully devoted to the Lord? Completely? Well, the Bible says that we're sinners and we fall short of the glory of God, so there's going to be times where we stumble. There's going to be times when we sin. There's going to be times where our hearts are hardened to the truth. There's going to be times where um, the soil within our heart only wants to go allow the Lord to go so deep, and there's an underlying issue that's hard underneath that needs to be broken up. There's going to be times where we accept the lies of the devil into our spirit, and they spread up like weeds choking out the truth. There's going to be times like that, people. But... We can come to the Lord. We can come to the Lord. We can ask him to be merciful and give us the forgiveness that we so need to make it through this life and live a life that's pleasing to him. Yes, we can be healthy because there's good soil. You see, there is softness of heart that God desires his people to have. The heart softness accompanied by true repentance and a willing to do what God wants us to do. Giving Jesus the lordship of our lives. The cleansing sacrificial work of Jesus can take care of all of our hang-ups. And all of our hardnesses can be removed. And he can give us a heart of flesh. Why? Why? Because he's good. And he wants us to walk with him. And to, keep, and to walk in step with him. And he desires for us to enter the kingdom having glorified him in our lives. All the way through. So if you've found yourself in these states that aren't pleasing to the Lord, I'm calling this for what it is. You need to repent. Repent. You need to ask the Lord to soften your heart, to, to pull the weeds. 
to break up the follow ground, the hard and pack down. You know, sometimes, you notice that first illustration? The seed fell on the path, it was packed down. Sometimes people walk on our hearts and repetitive pounding on our hearts. We get beaten and battered and our hearts become hard because we can't, we can't be vulnerable to allow people or God to come in. We harden our hearts to protect ourselves. God can take his plow and plow up that ground. He can give you a heart of flesh where right now you might have a heart of stone. Come unto the Lord, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the message that's being sent out today. The parable shows us that the word that is planted, the word of truth that is planted, something will happen with it. Fruit is the desired um, outcome for the farmer. Fruit is the desired outcome for the farmer's helpers. That's the, that's the desire. The question is, will I yield? Will I come? Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. He does. I pray that this week coming into the new year, that our hearts would be pliable before the Lord, that we'd just lay down our burdens and lay down anything that gets in the way. Repent where repentance is required. And we need God's help even to do that, don't we? We can't repent just by trying to pull ourselves into that zone. We need the Lord to take us there. So today, let's bow in prayer as we close. Jesus, we come to you and we ask, Lord, that our hearts, God, would be pliable before you. God, if there's any hardness in us, God, we pray that you'd till it up so that we can receive the truth of your word deep within. God, if our walk with you has been superficial, Lord, I, I pray, Father, that you would, you would break up the, the underlying stone within us. Give us hearts of flesh. And Lord, if we've listened to lies and they've polluted our spirit, God, just weed us out, Lord, and help us to have hearts of flesh, to have hearts that are yielded to you, to have hearts like that of David, who is a man after your own heart. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your great uh, compassion, blot out our transgressions, O oh God. And purify us. Save us. We need you, Jesus. We can't walk this life alone. This morning, there's people out there that need to repent, Lord, but they can't even repent because their hearts are so hard. I just pray, Lord, that even now, that they would just humble themselves before you at this point. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you do your work. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your truth. Pray that everyone here would be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. May his grace and peace rest on you.